a term. Um, you know, it's someone like, uh, and I, I now have a, a website that I decided to dedicate specifically to this, uh, let's say, a constellation, not, not a movement, called alternativeright.com. Uh, when someone like Marionetti, you know, wrote a manifesto or something, I think he kind of created a movement um, with that manifesto. I didn't do anything like that. I think I was trying to put a name on something uh, that was that's already developing. It's a, a constellation of writers and thinkers. Uh, the alternative right is by no means a mass movement. Uh, it sadly uh, uh, is uh, not one possessing uh, think tank money and, uh, uh, and, and big foundation uh, donors and, and all of that kind of stuff. It's basically a, uh, a constellation of a lot of different thinkers uh, who have gone completely AWOL from the duopoly of conservative or republican uh, uh, politics in America. They've gone AWOL from the kind of lesser of two evils, whom are we going to support this year, uh, politics. And I, I think on a deeper level, uh, they, the alternative right questions the real fundamental egalitarian and democratic assumptions of both the left and the right, both the Democrats and the Republicans in the United States. Um, Alain de Benoit, uh, who's a, um, a member of the, the so-called you know, Nouvelle Droite, uh, the New Right in, in France, he, he once uh, addressed the French Communist Party, and he said that really left and right are no longer operative. What's operative is the center and the, the outliers, the center being egalitarianism, being democracy, being mass consumerism, so on, globalism, so on and so forth. Uh, and people kind of being on the outside. Uh, another one of my uh, friends and, and someone who's contributed to, uh, to the website, Jim Kalb, uh, he said, you know, what, what the alternative right is, is really is thinking the unthinkable, thinking something that's dangerous. And uh, uh, I, I think that's a, a very good definition. It's also worth pointing out that um, if you think about other, uh, let's say, deviations from the political norm in American history, uh, they very often agreed on fundamentals with, uh, with the party from whom they were, they were deviating from. If you think of uh, Robert Taft or someone like that, questioning the Cold War, questioning the Korean War, things like that. He basically agreed um, with the Republican Party, you know, conservatism on, on, on the big issues. Uh, we don't. Uh, and, I, and again, I, I think that's a, that's a very important thing. Uh, if I were to describe um, the alternative right in, in one way, I could um, list a number of people and, and, and websites and publications. Certainly, uh, many of them are here you know, today. I would certainly uh, uh, talk about Peter Bremelo and, and, and Vidare and uh, Paul Gottfried as our, our, our theorist. Uh, also, I would, uh, there's another thing that I'll stress, and I'm going to return to this a little bit later in the talk, but there's a whole blogosphere that's developed around uh, Steve Saylor, and, uh, and basically something that I think now is being called HBD, which is human biodiversity. It, it, it was formerly called uh, sociobiology, and it also is related to what might be called race realism. Um, and in some ways related to white nationalism, if you think of uh, Jira Taylor and people like that. But there's a whole blogosphere focused around HBD. Uh, and this is, again, something that is um, without question taboo uh, in the mainstream uh, of both left and right. And I, I think it's something that, uh, uh, that, it, that is certainly a kind of you know, engine driving the alternative right. It's something that, that separates us from, uh, from pretty much everyone else. And there's also uh, the other aspect, which is a... Um, some you know, very crucial insights from Austrian economics. Um, and I'm going to particularly stress a, a certain kind of uh, apocalypseism uh, 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 later in the talk of, um, of what that means for us. Um, I'll really, before I begin, I'll, I'll just quickly lay out um, uh, some groundwork, although maybe I don't need to do that. I, I think um, uh, Hans is very good at talking about the, the paleoconservative movement as kind of a, uh, uh, as a rear guard, hastily assembled action against neoconservative ascendancy within the, uh, within the conservative movement of GOP. Um, you also have something that uh, is certainly also that, influenced, uh, that influences uh, us, uh, if you think of the old right. Um, but in some ways, that, that, that's a bit of a myth. The old right is a, uh, 
uh, you know, consist of a great literary stylist and, and philosophers like H.L. Mencken or Albert J. Nock, Garrett Garrett, Rose Wilder Lane, maybe even Ayn Rand. Uh, but this is something that was in some ways, it, it was invented by Murray Rothbard um, uh, after the fact. Uh, it, it was, uh, it, it, most of these people did not know one another. They certainly were not working in any kind of movement. And so to say that that was betrayed or uh, to talk about, you know, with Justin Raimondo um, wrote a book under Rothbard's uh, guidance about the lost legacy of the conservative movement. To call the old right a lost legacy of the conservative movement, I, I think is uh, a, a bit wishful thinking. Uh, not to say that any of those people aren't great and influential, but, um, uh, you know, but again, that, that's, uh, you know, to, to think of us continuing the old right or something like that, I, I, don't, I don't think that's, uh, uh, that's possible. There's also the, the French New Right, which I, of course, uh, mentioned. Um, and there's also something that I'm going to dwell on um, today, which is the American conservative movement and what's a kind of Buckley-eyed movement. Um, I think also what is important with that is that uh, people, contemporary conservatives, are either completely unaware of something like the old right, the French new right, or even the paleos, or else they totally reject them uh, as somehow anti-American or anti-Semitic or, or, or racist or evil or left-wing or, or something like that. Uh, and, and I think that's, uh, that's fairly important. Uh, there is a, a very strong hegemony in, uh, in, in the American discourse on, on, on both sides that is simply not going to recognize, in some ways, these, these other divergences and things that are, um, that are much more uh, intellectually stimulating, in, in my opinion. Um, let me talk uh, a little bit about uh, conservatism uh, in general, and, uh, and, and also I'm going to um, talk about a, a certain kind of problematic uh, relation that, um, or a problem, problematic um, position that the American conservative movement, the Buckley Act movement, has taken. And I think that's actually very good at, at really getting to where this new alternative right is diverging um, from the mainstream conservative movement. Um, conservatism, uh, perhaps despite its pretensions, is a scandalously relativist mode of thought. A conservative conserves something and he's thus inseparable from the social order and the class, usually a ruling class, that he has chosen to defend. Uh, Karl Mannheim, the uh, Hungarian Jewish social scientist, um, discussed the fact that conservatism really lacks uh, a priori, and it's, but it's, uh, it has great abundance of hick und nunc, uh, perhaps also ad hoc. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a form of thought where you are really defending a specific social order in a class. Uh, so thus, Edmund Burke is without question a conservative, uh, but then so is uh, Brezhnev, uh, is also a very conservative thinker. He, was a, uh, he consolidated an empire. The, uh, the 1991 hardliners who uh, attempted a coup uh, in, in Moscow were, were deeply conservative people. They were trying, they were kind of a last gasp of, uh, of a particular version of the Russian Empire. Um, and so what I think, in some ways, these, these conservatism was always relying on a certain revolution. And in some ways, um, the, way, the way I would think about this is that there's, with conservative thought, there's a, there's a kind of cancellation effect, um, where in some ways, uh, cause sometimes, uh, um, uh, or sometimes the effect precedes cause. Uh, they kind of have things backwards. And, um, you know, one, one joke that I, uh, I, uh, I, or one, you know, anecdote that I, I like is from a, um, a movie called uh, To Be or Not to Be, which was a, uh, is a 1940 comedy. It's, it's very, very good. It's kind of an improbable comedy about a, uh, a, uh, a husband and wife acting team in a Polish theater troupe in occupied Warsaw. And, um, uh, the, as the joke goes, the, um, the, the husband comes back, he sees his wife, and he says, oh, I just got back from the poster maker, and I just insisted that uh, your name get top billing above mine in our next production. And, uh, and she said, oh, you know, you know, you deserve it, darling. And, you know, she says, oh, well, that's, that's so wonderful, I, I appreciate that, but you, you really needn't 
do that. Uh, it, it's simply not necessary. And he goes, oh, I knew you were going to say that, and that's why I told the poster maker to put my name back on top. <laughs> and uh, I, I think that kind of psychological cancellation where um, some previous revolution, some previous social deviation has kind of reimagined as conservative is, uh, is an essential characteristic of conservative thought. Um, and so, you know, if we, if we look at what, uh, you know, who are the conservatives today, you know, in some ways you could probably say the, uh, the liberal establishment is a deeply conservative. I mean, David Frum, uh, David Broder, the Washington Post, all, you know, Keith Olbermann, various, various, you know, big name liberals are really deeply conservative people. They, they are, they are consolidating and fighting against uh, people who are going to upset their order. Uh, they, they love moderates. Moderates are beloved. Conservative moderates particularly are beloved figures. And, uh, you know, and if, you, if you really question anything about the welfare warfare state, you must be kind of delusional or, or, or perhaps evil and racist, or you should be you know, maybe jailed or locked up. Uh, I, I, you know, I think that that is basically the the, the mode of thought, and I think that's a that's a very deeply uh, um, deeply conservative. Also, the but of course we do have conservatives in America, and I think in some ways their function um, is uh, what Murray Rothbard um, described them as uh, in, in the 1992 uh, John Randolph Club speech, which uh, which Hans has alluded to. He says a genuine conservative. Uh, the kind the liberal establishment loves, doesn't want to repeal or abolish anything. He is a kind and gentle soul who wants to conserve what left liberals have accomplished. And thus, you know, while my, my friend Paul Godfrey might rage at the conservative movement for its constant outreach to, to various minorities, for its, its discovery that Martin Luther King was actually a conservative theologian, uh, for its uh, support of not only the New Deal, next thing they support LBJ and the welfare state. Um, uh, you know, someone like Paul might, might be outraged by that, but in some ways it is, the conservative movement is serving its function uh, when it does like that. It's that constant kind of cancellation, if you think about it in a Hegelian sense, of the past and the kind of sliding forward. Um, real quickly, there of course was, uh, there is another conservative movement um, and, uh, oh, well, maybe before I say that, I'll mention, well, I'll just skip, skip over that. Th there is a, another conservative movement, and, um, and that's something in America that is actually, uh, it's, it's one that's very flexible, and, um, it, you know, it's a, it's a kind of grassroots conservative movement that you can trace back from, say, immigration restriction in the 20s. You could probably connect it with prohibition. Uh, you could connect it with the American First Movement. You could connect it with various grassroots populist appeals. You could even connect it with the Scopes uh, so-called monkey trial. You can connect it with basically populist appeals to the heartland, um, this notion that uh, one, one, one needs to be a, a kind of a dignified religious person in order for this constitutional uh, democratic uh, capitalist system to work, and, and various kind of grassroots popular appeals. I think in some ways left and right is a very visceral thing. It might very well be a, a genetic thing. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and certainly supporting America in the Cold War and, and elsewhere was just something that one did as a, as a kind of a, you know, upstanding uh, a person. Uh, this, this, this kind of, uh, this in many ways wasp, in many ways a kind of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, uh, a group that was the, the grassroots of, of conservatism, uh, they are a, a very uh, unpredictable bunch. I think someone like Sam Francis, uh, you know, in the, uh, in the 80s and 90s, he believed that these middle American radicals would, might very well kind of go and take their country back. Um, and he wanted to appeal to them. This is a kind of a dangerous appeal. I, I think there was a, uh, a Mars revolution, as he said, but uh, it, it sadly occurred in 2002, 2003, and they were eating freedom fries and, uh, and supporting uh, George Bush's war uh, in, in Iraq and elsewhere. So this is a, you know, this, this kind of grassroots populist, uh, white Christian, uh, you know, kind of thing. It's, it's not led by intellectuals, and it's, it, it can be turned in various directions. Certainly, it's, it's very excited by the Tea Parties. It's also very excited by Sarah Palin uh, and things like that. What I think is interesting about the conservative movement, um, and this is the, the Buckleyite one, the one, one by intellectuals, um, is that they, they certainly relied on this grassroots 
uh, WASP uh, base uh, for people who would, uh, who would certainly vote for their candidates, who would perhaps subscribe to their magazines, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and yet, they never really wanted to defend this group. They never explicitly wanted to defend it as a class uh, or as a people. And you see this throughout the, uh, uh, the people most admired by the conservative movement, such as um, Russell Kirk or Harry Jaffa and, uh, and various other luminaries uh, like this. They basically wanted to, uh, they, they had a, a kind of anti-historicist notion that they weren't actually defending the WASP founding stock of the United States, that in fact they were defending these kind of eternal values uh, that uh, are, are actually what Russell Sirk said they had an ontic status, that is they were independent and kind of internal and, and that was regardless of the people holding them. Um, so they, they basically had these notions of themselves. I think um, Harry Jaffa had a, um, d determined that really to be an American you needed a commitment to equality. And commitment should be a, uh, you know, should be a remind one of engagé, uh, a kind of a leftist appeal. So in some ways the, um, <clears throat> what, what you see with the conservative movement is this uh, attempt not to defend uh, bourgeois America. Uh, and instead to kind of have these pretenses of defending eternal values. And in some ways they became a kind of conservative version of the left. They had their own rights of man. They had their own demands that to really to be uh, an American is to embrace equality and things like that. And they, and they didn't in some ways stick up for us, uh, so to speak. Uh, you know, they, they stuck up for some value system that they uh, uh, that they were creating. Um, and you can also see how, how easily a movement like this, well, before I say that, you can also see that in some ways when you have this left liberal value, when you have this kind of uh, eternal value system that you create, this ontic system of values, and in some ways has nowhere else to slide uh, but left. Uh, you know, a, a lot of the, uh, the, the left liberals love to point out uh, how cr these crazy reactionary opinions that that, uh, that William Buckley had when he was a young man uh, and things like that. They, you know, the, uh, the conservative movement opposed civil rights. Uh, they wanted to repeal the New Deal and so on and so forth. But I think what's actually more telling is not so much that they had these opinions at one point, but that they were so easily, they could so easily slide to new ones. Uh, you know, it's the, the Buckleyite movement could at one point say, we're going to get rid of the New Deal, we, we, we dislike this MLK guy, and then a mere 10 years will pass, and they'll be deifying Martin Luther King as a conservative theologian, and talking about, you know, how we need to preserve the welfare state and, and preserve Medicare. Uh, the, these, this, when, you, when you're a conservative, yet you're really not defending a particular order, a social order, you, you have these values that can just float, you know, which way, uh, this way and, and that, and, uh, and certainly in our context, they have just, you know, almost inevitably shifted left. Um, of course, there is one thing that the, uh, the conservative movement um, has defended staunchly, um, and that is the warfare state uh, aspect, and if you think of, uh, uh, if you think of the new right as it came with Goldwater and things like this, they, they obviously they spoke a lot about constitutionalism, about you know getting rid of the welfare state. They also spoke a lot about rolling back communism. They, this transferred into rolling back uh, Islam or, or or something like this. Um, and if you really if you want to think about cultural or libertarian conservatives who latched on to this movement, uh, they in many ways should be considered. Uh, uh, full idiots to use the uh, Leninist term in, a, in an ironic manner. Uh, the conservative movement has done absolutely nothing for them and they've done pretty much everything uh, for things like the military industrial complex. Um, okay, so that's basically, I, I think that's uh, how I talk about conservatism in America. And I, I want to focus on a, a few things that really separate the alternative right uh, and why we're different and, and why uh, we are kind of questioning uh, these, uh, these values of the conservative movement on a very fundamental way. Um, and I'm going to talk about this in, in terms of HBD, human biodiversity. Um, you know, our, uh, the information age has certainly become an age of public outrage. 
Uh, you have every, certainly every week, there's some various race or, or gender scandal that goes on. If you, uh, you know, the, perhaps the Duke lacrosse case would be a, one that ha you know, happened a couple years ago that's pretty evident. And usually the right wing in America can be relied upon to criticize these things. Um, uh, you know, you, you can usually rely upon them to kind of point out the obvious and say that, um, you know, uh, no, Al Sharpton's a bad guy, he's ridiculous. Uh, you shouldn't just indulge in white guilt and say that uh, it's really slavery that keeps everyone down and that's why we have income or educational gaps. And that no, you know, a new uh, social program is actually not going to help black people. Uh, it, it, it might act very well, these new welfare programs are very well hurt them, and so on and so forth. They, they can usually be relied to, to point out the obvious. Uh, but what's important here is that the right always criticizes the left's race obsessions um, with the, within the context of its own Lysenkoism and version of multicultural togetherness. Uh, and if you put it another way, the right criticizes the left only within the horizon of egalitarianism. And therefore, what you really need for, say, African Americans, if they're not you know, achieving to the level of whites or Asians, is not a new welfare program because that won't work. But instead, you need a kind of values therapy uh, on them. They need to be taught about family values and constitutionalism, and, and soon they'll kind of rise up to the top. So basically, what the conservative movement has is its own egalitarian uh, multicultural uh, image of basically this kind of uh, society of interchangeable individuals that are basically classless and ethnicity and raceless. And, and you know, this is, and, and again, this goes back to this point of conser the American conservatism as basically a kind of version of the left. Uh, they have their own rights of man, and they, they, have, they have all this kind of stuff. Um, I think basically what is very important, one an important way to fight against this, and to fight against this on the most fundamental level, is a, a rational and a realistic understanding of, of race differences. Um, and certainly Richard Len will be speaking on this, so I, I don't think I need to, uh, to go into this much further. Um, there, there's obvious uh, overwhelming amount of evidence of, uh, of IQ differences between uh, uh, you know, Africans, uh, African Americans in America having usually IQ of 85, um, Latinos, Hispanics somewhere in the 90 range, uh, of white Americans as a kind of mean 100, usually Asians a little bit above that and Jews a little bit above that. Uh, there's an overwhelming amount of evidence that this exists. Um, there's also an overwhelming amount of genetic evidence uh, that this exists. Now, I don't say any of this. I don't think understanding, say, IQ differences is going to uh, is, is going to be very good at um, white consciousness raising or thinking, things like that. I think that is something that's the, uh, the domain of poetry and, uh, and, and literature and, uh, and philosophy, uh, maybe. I do think um, that having an understanding of this is essential um, as a, as a counterattack uh, against this ever encroaching welfare state and the ever uh, you know, expanding egalitarian um, ideology. Uh, I, I won't go in this because I, I, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to go over. Uh, but certainly, Marx, uh, uh, in his uh, Gotha program, uh, basically set out uh, very explicitly that equal rights are, are th these are basically bourgeois rights, and they are they are unequal rights in the sense that there is a natural aristocracy of talent. Uh, there is a natural aristocracy of ability. Um, and that basically there, th this, these equal or bourgeois rights are going to lead to unequal income, uh, unequal outcomes uh, and, and incomes. And, uh, and in a sense, what he wanted in a communist society is that we would move beyond mere uh, bourgeois equal rights and we'd, we'd uh, you know, soon fly the banner of from each according to his capacity to each according to his need. In some ways, Marx should be praised for his honesty uh, in the sense that he, he was, he, you know, when you, the typical leftist now, whenever you talk about, say, race differences or IQ, they think you're delusional or you're hateful or you're, you're, you're somehow crazy and should be locked up. Marx actually very much acknowledged the natural aristocracy of talent and ability, and he claimed that it, should, it must be crushed. 
Um, and, uh, you know, when you think about Murray Rothbard, was certainly well uh, aware of this fact and the, the, the importance of, uh, of understanding race differences. If you, if you look at his, uh, his praise of, say, uh, Charles Murray and, and Richard Hernstein's The Bell Curve, he asked the question of why we talk about race. Uh, and he said, if and when we as populists and libertarians abolish the welfare state in all its aspects, and property rights and the free markets are, are, are triumphant, many individuals and groups will predictably, predictably not like uh, uh, the end result. Uh, and that is the case, you know, certainly a great deal of the, uh, there might not be a black middle class, certainly, without the, the welfare state and, and federal employment. Uh, there, there are many people who benefit from that. And uh, in this case, uh, those ethnic and other groups who might um, be concentrated in lower income or less prestigious occupations, guided by their socialist mentors, will predictably raise the cry that the free, market the free market is evil and discriminatory, and that therefore collectivism is needed to redress the balance. In that case, the intelligence argument will become useful to defend the market economy and free society from ignorant or self-serving attacks. In short, racialist science is properly not an act of aggression um, or a cover for oppression of one group of, or another, but to the contrary, an operation in defense of private property and against assaults by aggressors. Uh, and I would just add, uh, in closing of this, uh, of this section, um, that I, I would really say that the left liberal establishment, for them, race is of paramount importance. They, they think about it, they, they might not think about anything else. It, it's kind of interesting, the, um, there's a former Tony Blair speechwriter, and uh, he admitted that uh, their immigration policy in the late 90s and early 2000s was 100% about race. It had nothing to do with the economy. They actually hoped that the economy wouldn't, was big enough to kind of absorb all these third world undesirables that were brought into the country. Uh, and, uh, and basically he wanted to, in his words, rub the right's face in diversity, to kind of build up so much diversity that they couldn't possibly get rid of it after about 10 years. So basically the left is always thinking about race. Uh, many right-wing people don't want to think about it because it's mean and nasty or it might mean you're a Nazi or something like that. Um, and so you, you know, the right might not want to think about race, but race is thinking about them. Uh, and you really can't choose where you fight battles. If you're being attacked by sea, you have to fight by sea. When you're being attacked by sea, you can't decide that you're going to raise an army on land. And if you're being attacked on the racial question, you need to, uh, to do a counterattack and the most fundamental aspect of that. Um, and, and not, you know, as I, as I mentioned before, just splurt out this conservative movement version of egalitarianism, which is that other races just need new values and they'll become Americans. Uh, and if you see also, this, is, this kind of egalitarianism on the domestic level is in some ways a kind of inside out or a microcosm, macrocosm of American foreign policy, where it's anyone can become an American if they have the proper democratic values. And as well, we want to turn everyone into an American. Uh, by you know, you know, declaring war on them and establishing new parliaments and uh, uh, and, and and whatnot. Um, okay, uh, I'm gonna I uh, might go over by a couple of minutes. Oh, I'm okay. Um, I'm gonna end up uh, just on uh, a, a talking a little bit about uh, Austrian economics and uh, and how this also is uh, is connected with uh, the alternative right as it's emerging uh, in the United States. Um, you know, Sir, uh, Sir Robert uh, Walpole uh, was probably the, he was a, a British uh, prime minister in the 1720s, he was probably the inventor of imperial finance. And uh, what he, he came up with this I idea, if you have a, a steady stream of income, i.e. taxation, uh, then you can basically keep buying, uh, you can keep issuing bond after bond and keep paying the interest of these bonds. And every time a bond matures, you can just issue a new one. And it actually, you never have to ultimately repay the debt, and this can go on uh, for infinity. Uh, and, uh, and this is something that uh, America has certainly learned this imperial lesson well. Uh, and if they have in some ways just put this on steroids, and if you add that with the, the kind of post bread and woods system of the dollar as a, as a, a, a world reserve currency, um, they have the ability to issue almost towards, inf they think, uh, infinitely, uh, you know, um, perpetually issue more and more bonds and perpetually 
uh, inflate and that they're going to kind of get away with it. Um, the only problem with this is that you see, uh, you, you see the kind of 12 to $13 trillion of, of national debt, uh, but that actually doesn't even come close to the some 70 to $100 trillion of unfunded liabilities. The only possible way uh, that the government would take care of that debt uh, would be uh, either to default, which I don't think they would ever do, or to print out of the, uh, their way out of it. I think they think they're going to get away with that printing, um, but, you know, uh, sad to say, the, the laws of gravity, uh, the laws of physics and the laws of the economics, uh, uh, they apply to the United States just as they apply to anyone else. Uh, and so basically what I, I, I think if you, if you begin with an insight like that, um, you're able to understand the degree to which uh, there is going to be a, a really a great monetary fiscal funding crisis in the United States future. Um, and you know, lots of lots of libertarians have imagined uh, what it would be like if the state were to collapse. If say, if we can just imagine this together, um, if the United States were unable to fund its imperial army, it was unable to keep the uh, the union together. What would happen? Many might imagine a kind of individualist order that would uh, that would arise. Um, but if we really think about this realistically, um, if this, uh, this situation occurred, where there was a, a serious monetary crisis, um, there would not, we would not break down to a kind of Cato Institute fantasy of, of, of individualist capitalist uh, selling things to one another and, and there would be no, no, no we're, we're totally interchangeable. Uh, we would actually experience whole new advancements in, in social intolerance. Uh, if the if the, the if the army were not able to be funded, they were not able to, to preserve order. You might very well have Latino nationalist uh, st uh, communities kind of almost uh, uh, arising in, in California and the Southwest. Uh, you might have various things arising in the inner cities that were uh, that were uh, again uh, you know race based in, in terms of black blacks. You might uh, you know Gary North might actually be able to establish a Christian Reconstructionist uh, Protestant state somewhere in the Midwest that would make uh, Calvin's Geneva seem like Cancun. Uh, you, uh, you, know, you, you would have these, basically with the, the collapse of the state, you would not have a kind of regression to this you know, individualist, libertarian uh, kind of fantasy. You would actually have whole new forms uh, of, of authority and identity uh, that would arise you know, uh, out of that chaos, and that in many ways these will be based on identity and ethnicity, they might be based on race, they will be based on religion. Um, and uh, so basically, the way I would, I would end with that is that um, uh, so many conservatives have always wanted to kind of turn back the clock. Um, you know, uh, in Rothbard, in, in his speech in 1992, he, uh, uh, he, he spoke about um, how uh, uh, you know, some people want to, you know, repeal the Great Society. You know, some others really want to repeal the New Deal. You know, I, others want to repeal Lincoln's administration. You know, some of us want to go back to the Constitution. Murray Rothbard wants to push further and go to the Articles of Confederation. There's also this, this tendency to always kind of want to keep turning back the clock. Um, and I think, in some ways, with the alternative right, uh, if you if you take this insight of the coming uh, monetary crisis in the United States you see that it's really not a question of turning back the clock, but it really is a, that possibility of imagining something very new, something new in the future. Uh, and so um, while uh, you know, Murray promised that he didn't want to just turn back the clock of social democracy, he wanted to break it, uh, I think the alternative right might be in a situation where uh, we will we'll no longer be bound uh, by that clock of the 20th century and we'll have something completely new. So I'll leave it on that. And uh, thank you uh, for inviting me.